Go ahead. Great. Um, I'm going to rush in now because I see I've lost a few minutes. Um, thank you again, Benjamin, and uh, the rest of the um, summer school organizers for giving me this time. So this is now my final short talk, uh, and I'm going to talk about how to become an RSE. Um, as again, my name is Kim Martin. I'm a, currently a postdoc at Stellenbosch University, and I've spent the last couple of years advocating for RSE in South Africa as part of my Software Sustainability Institute Fellowship. Uh, and just a reminder from the previous talks I've given, um, what is an RSE? So an RSE uh, is someone who combines professional software uh, engineering expertise with an understanding of research. And people like this, as I say, are very valuable in the academic ecosystem and increasingly so going forward. Um, the term was coined by the Software Sustainability Institute, um, and their, man, uh, their uh, manifesto says that all researchers should have access to basic software training, and this is something that RSEs can provide or should be able to provide. Software should be accepted as a valid research output. This is something that matters as far as RSEs' careers are concerned, um, and there should be reward and recognition for people who develop and also maintain this research software. Um, what does an RSE do? Um, so again, I learned about RSE for the first time at this R conference in 2021 um, and of the various things. So writing code would be one thing, but teaching researchers um, about software, how to do their own coding is also something that's very important. Um, and consultation in this case might be helping a researcher figure out how to best use an RSE skills and put that forward in a grant application to get funding to hire an RSE. Uh, the kind of problems that RSEs can help with um, so, uh, as I said, these are things that came from talking to researchers in Stellenbosch University, but I think this is fairly universal. Um, things around um, quality of code, uh, especially as, as code needs to be increasingly published. Uh, someone who is uh, more skilled than your average researcher is able to help that researcher by reviewing the code before it's published um, and help maybe improve the quality of that code, which helps, um, you know, reduces the loss of time and increases the potential for reuse of code. Um, and then also helping, again, on um, upskilling researchers so they can do more with um, th their coding skills. In terms of training opportunities for would-be RSCs, and I'm hoping that there's a few of you in the audience today, um, so you, you've taken the right step by starting with something like this uh, coding summer school. Um, I think you, you're off to a very, very good start, but there are also other opportunities for um, structured training that give you the right kind of skills um, as you develop as an ROC. So you may be familiar with the Carpentries. Um, so the Carpentries is it's a nonprofit organization that is focused on teaching foundational coding and data science skills to researchers. Uh, and they have different sort of branches um, depending on their focus. So there's like one that's more focused on data, one that's more focused on library science stuff, and then one that's more focused on, on software. And as a new would-be RSC, probably the software carpentry lessons are going to be more appropriate to you, but I think you can get a lot of value from any of the carpentry's workshops. And these workshops are um, normally run, they run in person and online, um, often hosted by universities. You can find more information on the carpentry's website but one of the great things about the Carpentries is their teaching material is available for free um, under an open source license and is continually being improved upon by the, the Carpentries community. In fact, one of their, um, their sort of requirements for someone who is wanting to be certified as a Carpentries trainer, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit, um, one of the requirements for getting certified is to contribute something to the online um, uh, um, workshop material so you need i mean something as minor as a spe correcting a spelling error but um people can also make some more substantial improvements so basically this is an ever evolving and improving um, body of information that you have free access to um similar to the carpentries but maybe but more on the sort of intermediate and, and more moving towards more advanced skills um, is the code refinery. So code refinery runs in a fairly sim similar way the, the materials are all made available online their workshops are um, uh, sort of multi-day workshops that are free to attend. Um, I would strongly recommend looking at their workshops and trying to attend the one if you can. And the skills that they give are very useful for people who are moving their careers in a more of an, an RSC direction. Uh, something that is actually still in development, as far as I'm aware, is the Universe HPC project. Um, and they are looking to develop a training curriculum framework 
um, for research software engineers, high, more focusing on high performance computing, but but trying to sort of give general good skills as well. Um, this is very much, I think, work, watch this space because anything along these lines is very exciting in terms of, as I say, more on the systemic picture, but more professionalizing the RSE role, which is something that is, is ongoing and has been going on for the last 10 years. And this is actually a, a screenshot from um, Jeremy Cohen's talk um, in October last year. Um, so Jeremy gave a talk as part of the NITEX mini school on RSE. Um, all those talks are available on YouTube. Um, and talking, and I, I thought it was quite important to sort of highlight the, the value that he's um, putting onto uh, structured skills development. So he's highlighting how um, self-taught developers frequently learn only the skills they need when they need them. It's easy to miss the key related skills and best practices that support, for example, quality and efficiency in code. Uh, and it's possible to progress a long way on limited foundational knowledge. This can lead to long-term future challenges. So this to me is sort of like the, the picture of, of um, software engineering in, in a research environment absent the the concept of research software engineering well, as a role. Because um, typically PhD students and postdocs, and I'm an example of this, learn as they can in a very sort of ad hoc way. Um, and it is sort of basically this, this, this feeling of being a perpetual amateur desperately trying to do your, the best you can. There is a lot of value to being able to connect to um, existing uh, let's say, structured education and also people who are more skilled than you that you can learn from. Um, and just to highlight now again, um, as I believe that teaching researchers best practices and the foundations of coding is something that RSEs, one of the values that a value adds that an RSE gives in an academic environment, um, as a would-be developing, starting out RSE, I think it's very important to take um, opportunities to learn how to teach and to get a training or experience in teaching. And again, the, one of the say this is this is one of the sort of basic things that an RSE does. And one way that is one very good way of being able to get this kind of experience and training in teaching would be connecting with the carpentries. So as I said, the Carpentries has these different branches, Software Carpentry, Data Carpentry, Library Carpentry, um, and they're based on this community of volunteers who do the teaching and also do the development of the lessons. The lessons um, tend to be things along the line, or the foundational lessons include using the Unix shell, which is important for cloud computing and HPC, Git for version control, and R or Python. Uh, and given that um, you know you're all in this summer school getting uh, at least an introduction to Python, you're well on your way to being able to now teach Python to to complete beginners in the future. Um, and in fact, the best way to, to learn is to teach. And also, the best teachers are often people who have fairly recently learned the thing, because um, one of the so the carpentries when it trains people on how to be teachers, you get warned about things like um, it's called expert blindness where someone who is so experienced and so expert at a particular thing is actually a really bad teacher because they're so far from being able to empathize with, with new beginners in, in the subject. Whereas, you know, if you've fairly recently learned something, you're probably quite empathetic with the, you know, you, you'd be able to appreciate where a learner might get confused uh, and, and uh, anticipate what you could do to help them um, follow along with where you're going. Um, yes, so uh, I would recommend looking into becoming a carpentries instructor. There are often um, sponsored position, uh, sponsored uh, seats for getting the training and getting the certification. Um, again, just as a general thing, I would say, you know, do your best to develop the skills um, that sort of match the RSC role and adopt best practices wherever you can. This again is in this in this context of you know this increasing trend towards open science, where increasingly the expectation is that code must be published, and if the code is going to be published, then you know it should be good code, it should be written to um, fairly good standards, it should be easy for someone who understands that language to be able to follow what you're trying to do, um, and there's a whole bunch of other things that that can be taken into account, including like licensing and things like that. And these are, I'd say, as as you become more skilled as an RSC, you become more and more familiar with these things. 
Um, one resource that would be very good for um, getting a sense of this kind of thing would be the Turing Way. Uh, it's not the only um, guide out there, but I think it's a very, very good one. And it's, again, something that's being uh, collaboratively and continuously developed by a community. Um, and you'll notice here their guide for reproducible research includes things like version control and licensing, um, code quality, code testing, code reviewing. These are all very important skills and things to take into account. And then just, uh, again, I mean, I think this is a sort of personal um, flag that I've been flying for a while, um, but I do think it's important, um, which is the value of a collegial environment, for example, an RSC group, um, and getting support. So it's been um, basically my uh, driver, my personal driver, since I first learned about the RSC term and decided I wanted to be an RSC, was to find um, find the others find a group of people that I could connect with, that I could learn from, because my my in, instinctive understanding is the sitting in a corner by yourself uh, as, you know, the only person who's writing Python code in, an, in a research group, which seems to be very common, um, for like postdocs and PhD students, depending on, you know, your situation, but that's not a great way of learning and improving. It's not a very efficient way of, of developing yourself as a profession. You really want to try and be part of some kind of community and, and work as closely as, as possible with other people. And as I said, um, I think yesterday, the ability to work with other people is in itself a very valuable skill that you want to take every opportunity to develop. Um, so again, RSC groups, um, they are basically RSCs that work for researchers across an organization. They tend to be you know, part of a, of, a, of a comprehensive group and they often work together. Um, last year, I was lucky enough to be able to visit um, a number of different universities in the UK and 14 different universities, and I interviewed RSEs at 25 different RSE groups to get an understanding of what it was to be in one of these groups. Um, and as I mentioned before, one of the things that jumped out at me was um, people talking about what, what about being in the group helped, uh, helped them out in their careers. And things to do with quality control and continuing professional development. So, for example, code review, where you've got someone else looking over your shoulder and, and sort of checking you on your code and making a, a critical, let's say, um, positive critical suggestions is something that's very valuable. And working together with someone where you're actually working with another, at least one other RSC on the same code base using version control is, again, an extremely valuable um, experience and, and a way of upskilling yourself very fast. Um, and then book clubs and tech talks and all these other little peripheral fun and useful things. And again, being part of a group where you're actually being managed by someone who understands what it is to be an RSC and what you're trying to do, I think is also something that um, makes a significant difference. Because again, contrast that with the typical uh, scenario of someone who is a sort of proto RSC, you know, doing an RSC type job, but not actually called an RSC, uh, maybe uh, being part of an, a research group and actually their bosses might well be someone who doesn't even program themselves. So they don't actually get any real technical mentorship or leadership and they've got to try and figure everything out by themselves. And that for me is a recipe for uh, frustration, imposter syndrome and inefficiency. Um, yeah, if you get the opportunity to join an RSC group, and as, as I say, there's uh, not very many opportunities for that in South Africa uh, or Africa so far, although um, I can you know, say RSC at Sun is in development at Stellenbosch University, and I believe that the UCTE research office is also developing um, this kind of capacity. Um, but joining an RSC group is something that would probably be very, um, a very good move uh, to, 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 as you say, skill yourself up very quickly. Um, and in terms of how to join a group or what they expect, I mean, this is an example of the recruitment page from uh, a Finnish RSE group. Um, and they're basically saying, you know, if, you if you're reasonably good at some programming concepts, you're eager to learn, you know, maybe one language well, you can shell scripts. So let's say if you've done the Carpentries workshop and you've got like Unix and, and Bash scripting under your belt, uh, and if you're generally familiar with Linux, they, they say that that is sufficient for you to join them as an RSE. Um, and uh, yeah, something that I also wanted to highlight, I maybe didn't um, emphasize this enough in my previous talks, uh, this came out of my road trip around the UK of interviewing these RSEs. Um, and now this is a slide from someone else's presentation, but um, there was a sort of perception that RSEs typically follow a, a very sort of clear stereotype, you know, and it's also that male, white, uh, and I'm not nothing against white males, but um, you know, just just to highlight that, that, the, that there is more diversity than than just a sort of like hardcore STEM, um, you know, sort of math or computer science based person. 
um, there's actually a lot more diversity and actually there's a lot of value for diversity that, as in people who come from different va backgrounds are valued and can add value. So for example, there's a lot of um, need for RSEs on the humanities side and someone who has a humanities background and is willing to learn those skills um, could, could fill those needs. Um, again, if you want to have a bit more of a sense of where different RSCs come from, the Society of RSC of Research Software Engineering, you can Google them, has published a number of different what they call RSC journeys, where they have um, got little blog posts, write-ups about different people and how they became RSC, which might be quite nice to read. Um, and I would, again, emphasize you should where possible, join existing communities to connect with peers and learn more. So the Society of Research Software Engineering, if you see at the bottom there, it says membership to the society is open to anyone from anywhere in the world, but you don't actually need to become a, a paid up member. You can actually just join their Slack um, uh, channel for free and start talking to people, which, which I would recommend. There's also the, um, there is also the RSSE Africa Forum, which is um, for people who are RSEs or interested in RSE on the African continent. I would very strongly recommend you get involved with that. Um, it pays to have um, local connections and we, we need to build up this community more. Um, and then um, just to highlight that NITEX has been very supportive of, of RSE as a role. Uh, and you can learn more about RSE by looking at the talks that were part of the uh, mini school that I helped organize um, in October last year. So again, thank you very much. Um, thank you to the Software Sustainability Institute, the RC community, my bosses, NITEX, uh, and thank you for your time and listening. I hope this has been helpful. Yes, great. Um, thanks so much, uh, Kim. We do have a question on the chat. Um, Jan says, um, there are some IP in the code from Carpentries. If it is open source, how do they protect the IP? Uh, asking from experience is only sharing the results with the client, not the how. Uh, please ask Jan to correct me if I misunderstood the question. Um, I'll do my best with answering. So um, my understanding with uh, when it comes to IP, as I say, the, the mission, the, the Carpentries is a nonprofit. Their mission is to disseminate trainings and improve best practices across um, research culture. Uh, I don't think they're particularly worried about IP. Um, their licensing for their materials, I think, is basically it's free to use, it's free to modify. I think they, I think the license is such that they want um, acknowledgement, but you can correct me on that. Um, in terms of running workshops, running Carpentries workshops, um, you are free to use their materials to run the carp to run a workshop, but you cannot call it a Carpentries workshop unless you yourself are a certified Carpentries instructor. Um, there's many ways of becoming a, a Carpentries instructor. I mean, as I said, um, you, you can do it either by paying the Carpentries and getting onto one of their courses. Um, and it's a relatively easy, it's not, a, it's not particularly onerous, but it is useful, the training they give. Um, there's also many, it's quite common for um, uh, seats, they call them, to become a Carpentries, to get trained as a Carpentries instructor and certified. It's quite common for these seats to be made freely um, open for by application for people who are interested in becoming instructors. And those might be made available by, you know, the Carpentries itself, or maybe by um, a member institution. So the Carpentries is, is funded um, to a degree by uh, organizations such as universities that become members. And in exchange for their membership fees, those universities would get um, a number of seats and also a number of workshops that the Carpentries will organize for them. But to Let's say that you don't have a Carpentries um, instructor certification. You can still run the workshop, just don't call it Carpentries. Acknowledge them, but, but make it clear. If you have yourself, I mean, so I'm a Carpentries instructor. Um, I'm able to run as many Carpentries workshops as I like, branded as a Carpentries workshop, and I don't have to pay the Carpentries for the, for the privilege of doing so. Um, I, can just, I can just do it. Um, so, like I said, it's, that's that's my understanding of how things work. It's not it's 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 about the mission, not about um, capitalizing on their IP. Have I answered that question, Johan? Uh, Jan? Um, I, I think you can maybe respond uh, by Slack because I know you are on there. So, just have one yep. more question from Chepo. Um, what is the time horizon? A year, six months, three years to become a fairly competent RSE? in scientific computation or relevant areas? I think that's a bit of a, how long is a piece of string? It depends a lot on your background, uh, your motivation. 
uh, and the resources and um, opportunities that are, you have available to you. Um, I, I mean, I think you can start adding adding value um, within about six months or so. I mean, like basically, as as soon as you're thinking about best practices and paying attention and doing your best, you are making things better. Um, when it comes to like trying to get a job as an RSE, again, that, that that's a how long is a piece of string. But I, I'm, I, again, I think if you do your best at turning your um, your existing experience to demonstrating that you are able to add these kind of improvements, that's all to the better. So for example, if you're a PhD student or a postdoc um, and you need to do some data analysis or, or, or write software for any reason at all, um, try to do it in a way that you can then highlight to other people how you're using best practices. So for example, figure out how to use Git, Carpentries will help you with that, Code Refinery will help you with that, and try to get your code available that other people can see it, for example. Um, but yeah, I don't think I can give you a clear answer on that one. Uh, great, thanks so much, uh, Kim. Um, as I said, uh, you, I do see you on Slack now, so um, anyone can just contact you to get more information. Thank you so much, and thank you for your series of talks. It was very enlightening to everyone, I think. Um, it has really spurred up a lot of conversation uh, about this topic. Thank you so much. Thanks, Benjamin.